thank you for joining me for another study of Jesus in Scripture. Let's jump right in. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the most important event in history. This Sunday will be celebrated as Easter Sunday. We know exactly when Jesus was crucified. It was the Friday before the Passover. He was our Passover lamb who took away all of our sins once and for all. So according to the calendar, it was this weekend that marks the anniversary of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. In this study, we have been exploring scripture and discussing the many ways that the Old Testament is Christ-centered. I've been referring to John 5, uh, verse 39, as kind of the anchor text of all of this, where Jesus says, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And indeed, the entire Old Testament is all about Jesus. Therefore, I'm leading the study because I am certain that we cannot even begin to understand the scope of God's love for us if we don't know that Jesus' mission to save us from sin is part of an eternal plan. An eternal plan that was planned before the existence of the world. Um, it was conceived in the heavenly realms before creation. And that's in Ephesians chapter 1. Please read it. Jesus is personal. He speaks to each one of us as individuals. Jesus is the person in whom God reveals himself. God is love. And Jesus is the person that shows us that the love of God is enduring and redeeming. We read in Jeremiah 31 verse 3, the Lord God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It was God's will that he would build an enduring home for us, a land and an inheritance that could never pass away. We were created to be covered with the person who is Jesus so that in him we would lack nothing. Jesus is the uniter. He unites us with God, and he unites the scripture both old and new. Jesus said that all scripture was about him. The Old Testament is incredibly Christ-centered. The thread throughout scripture is consistently Christ. The covering of Adam and Eve, the animal skins, the flood, the ark, the Passover and the Red Sea, the wilderness and the promised land, the exile and return, war and peace, kingdoms and kings, prophets and priests, songs of lament and rejoicing, and especially the lives of faithful sufferers and the blood of righteous martyrs. The person of Jesus shaped all of this to prepare the world for the time when he would become the seed of woman, first prophesied in Genesis 3, verse 15. The Old Testament was laying the groundwork for the time when it was just perfect for Jesus to present himself as the Lamb of God, who, is John the, who as John the Baptist so beautifully said, takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came to die on the cross to redeem us from all sin. He said it himself in John 12, 27 through 30. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it, and some said it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death that he would die. 
Jesus himself provided the sacrifice for sin, as was taught when Isaac asked his father, Abraham, where the sacrifice was. Abraham's answer was led by the Holy Spirit to say, God will provide. As John 3.16 says, he provided his only begotten son. The great provision was at Calvary. Last week we saw where in Psalms 22, the crucifixion was clearly depicted by David in a song that David recorded for us. Jesus even quotes that song while hanging on the cross. He quotes the first verse of that song and he quotes the last verse of that song. Um, it's, a, it's a song of victory. Jesus was not defeated. His father had not abandoned him. Instead, it was the culmination of the, the plan of salvation coming to a close and coming to a victorious and amazing conclusion where that we all could be ushered in to the salvation of God. It brought into the family of God, made heirs to stand beside our Lord and brother Jesus and raised up with him to walk in eternal life. Today, I want to look at Isaiah 53. This chapter was written about 800 years before the birth of Christ, and yet it foretells the suffering of our Lord. 800 years before this, the, the Romans did not even exist. There was no crucifixion. No one knew how to crucify a, a person that, that had not been invented yet. But we see here in Isaiah 53, uh, a depiction of, a, of the crucifixion. Let's go right into it. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing is in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear the iniquities, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. 
John in his gospel confirmed that Isaiah indeed was speaking of Jesus. When we read in John chapter 12, 37 through 47, after Jesus had performed many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fill the, the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the Lord, the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes or understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders of, of the Pharisees, believed in him. But because the Pharisees, because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but I came to save the world. Isaiah 53 is referred to seven times in the New Testament. Seven times in, in Scripture it represents perfection. Um, perhaps it's to indicate how perfect Christ's work of atonement is and how perfectly it takes away our sin. He bore our punishment and was pierced for our transgressions. Isaiah 53 is the good news we are to proclaim to the nations. The first example of an evangelist teaching the nations is Philip sharing the gospel to an official from Ethiopia in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 39. The story of the Ethiopian eunuch is as follows. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he sta started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that spirit and stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip up into the chariot to sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch was reading from the passage we know today as Isaiah 53. The eunuch asked Philip, Please tell me, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began that with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, salvation has come to all mankind 
to all the nations. The, the, the promise of Abraham that through your seed, not seeds, but your seed, that one seed who was Jesus, that one person who would be your descendant will bless the entire earth. All mankind will be blessed because of you and your faith, faithfulness. Because of the good news about Jesus, he is risen. And we too shall rise like the Ethiopian, symbolized by rising up out of the watery grave of baptism to be with him forever and ever. Hallelujah and amen. Happy Easter, and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. And just, it's amazing that scripture ties together so beautifully that all of the Old Testament was written for the introduction of Jesus into the world. And Isaiah 53 is an amazing example of that. And it's, and it's preached upon many times, seven times in the New Testament. And it's been preached countless times since because it depicts the gospel, the love of God, and what he has done for us. It's a great story. It's the good news. Uh, let's, let's share it whenever we have the opportunity. Happy Easter, and until we can visit again next week, goodbye and God bless.